well, uh, maybe I'll start at the end of, uh, and that is, I wrote this book, For Giving, in, in 1997, it was published, and, uh, and I've done several, um, several uh, anthologies about the gift economy of people's, different people's writing about it. And then now, most recently, um, there's this book, and then I did a, a, a web book called Homo Donans, in uh, 2007, this is from last year, and it's my magnum opus, if anybody's interested, that's it. Well, um, I, I was born in Texas, and uh, I, um, I always, I was from a well-to-do family, and I always wondered why some people were poor and other people were rich. And so I asked my parents and their friends, and they said, well, uh, rich people are smarter. <laughs> or they said, rich people are luckier. Um, and those answers did not, uh, didn't satisfy me. And so I, for, for, um, for several years, I, I you know, was thinking about it a lot. And, uh, and then I met an Italian semiotician professor and uh, I asked him about it. And he said, well, uh, rich people are rich because poor people are poor. There's a transfer of wealth going on between one and the other. And that did satisfy me. I understood why uh, this inequality was happening. And so then um, I married this professor <laughs> and moved to Italy. <coughs> and he was somewhat older than me, and so well, he was introduced into all of the whatever, politics and stuff there he, he was in, involved. And so I got a good uh, left-wing uh, consciousness raising there um, in, my, in my early 20s. And um, we went to a, um, a meeting of some people that were going to apply Marx's analysis of the commodity and money to language. And I was just totally bowled over by this idea and, and also by Marxism. And, and so I, I, you know, I had this aha moment and kind of, uh, you know, had to go in the other room and lie down because it was so <laughs> involving. And, uh, and then um, after that, I started studying it, and, and he wrote a couple of books about applying uh, Marx's analysis to language. And one of the books is called Language as Labor and Trade. And um, I was, began to have children and so forth, and I didn't, I, I, I didn't agree with what he was saying because my children were learning language, but they didn't know about the market. They couldn't, they didn't understand the market. They couldn't uh, buy or sell anything, and the, but they were already talking. And then I thought, well, there are native people in the, in, in, in the United States, for example, didn't have markets, and yet they could speak. So why is, why could it, it can't be that the market is the basis of language, or exchange is the basic of la basis of language. It could be the other way around, but it can't be that. So I began to develop my own uh, theory back then, and when, what was it then? You know, I was taking care of my children, and if it was some kind of an economy, it was this maternal giving and receiving that was kind of like the gift economy of the native people. So, um, so already back then in the 60s, I had started thinking about the gift economy as a, possibil a possibility of having a really deep pattern that, uh, that comes out in language. And now, actually last year, I finally finished this book where I finally came out with the explanation of how that works. It's taken me a long time, but I did it. So uh, back in the 60s, then, I had already begun to understand that the market itself is causing our problems, and it's not just capitalism. 
Then in the late 70s and early 80s, when I was in a feminist consciousness raising group, I realized that the unremunerated work that women do in the so-called domestic sphere could be seen as an economy outside the market, similar to the so-called pre-market economies of many indigenous people. Like those economies, the d domestic economy is vulnerable to colonization by the market. But also like them, it has a logic of its own, which is different from quid pro quo exchange. This logic is based on giving in order to satisfy needs. It is transitive and it confers value onto the receiver by implication. That is, if you hadn't thought the other person was valuable, you wouldn't have given them any gifts. The logic of exchange is based on giving in order to get. It is intransitive, requires the equivalence of products and it's self-reflecting. It gives value to the self by implication. Exchange discounts and exploits the unilateral gift, and by not recognizing its logic, makes us consider gifting irrational. I call the domestic economy a gift economy because its core is giving free gifts and services to children as well as to the other members of the family and the community. Marcel Mose, in 1923, wrote about the gift economies of indigenous people, which had been studied by anthropologists in the early 20th century. But he saw them as following a three-step process of giving, receiving, and giving back. I see the first two steps of this process as basic, and I believe the positive and inclusive interaction they constitute already connects the interactors and establishes a relationship. This makes giving and receiving the basis of the relational economics that are now seen as constituting a more human potential of the market. Uh, in the early days, in the 1980s, no one I knew in the USA was interested in the gift economy theory. So I started trying to practice it through a foundation. Now, after the blatant fa failures of capitalism, the idea of a free, non-market economy has sprung up again and again among people seeking communitary, life-oriented solutions. Moreover, the internet has made the term gift economy almost a household word. As long as it does not threaten mainstream economics too much, the gift economies can spread everywhere. But for many, free is a four-letter word. For example, the accessibility of free music on the internet has deeply threatened and changed the corporate music business world. One CEO I heard on TV said despairingly, we have done everything we can to beat them, but you can't compete with free. The kind of capitalism we are living in has only re re really become so extreme during the last century. Before, there were more neighborly relations based on trust and free cooperation outside the market. Our presently rapidly uh, mutating economic system, patriarchal capitalism or capitalist patriarchy, is limited historically but has rapidly expanded geographically, commodifying gifts of all kinds, water, seeds, air, even our genes. Trade packs like TPP and TTIP open the way for the seizure of gifts internationally with no recourse to law to keep them in the public domain. In fact, the new trade laws protect the powerful against the weak. There are many examples of the gift economy in matriarchal cultures. That is, matriarchy seen not as a mirror image of patriarchy, but as a uh, social organization with maternal values for everyone. In, uh, also in subsistence economies and in the social experiments that are now propagating everywhere. Eco-villages, free stores, karma cafes, rainbow gathering, burning man gatherings, and in such laudable efforts as code Pink's peace economy. 
The free software movement, which started with GNU and Linux, promoted a c competition in gifting that was viewed along Western anthropological lines as a contest to become the big man. But it has also opened a way of collaborating and of forming groups in horizontal peer-to-peer, many-to-many ways. Wikipedia is a good example of the free gift economy in action. Couch surfing is another. Many of these initiatives fill in gaps in the market economy, though, and to a certain extent, they rely on it. Widespread commerce and computer hardware is necessary for Wikipedia to exist, and couch surfing requires not only the computer, but also the ability to use commercial means to travel from place to place. Still, these new initiatives are a very positive development because they show that a different practice and a different paradigm are possible. Although the gift economy still exists in indigenous and matriarchal societies, it is largely unrecognized or discredited as traditional or primitive by the mainstream people who are telling the tale. I believe the gift economy also exists within capitalism, as I said, within the so-called domestic sphere, in the free housework and childcare done mainly by women. In fact, free work is gift work, given to satisfy needs. Free is a mode of distribution. My hypothesis is that the maternal economy of unilateral giving without an equivalent return is the basic human economy from which other economies derive and of which they are elaborations. By considering the unilateral gift giving as an economy on its own, a mode of distribution that has been largely the province of women and specifically of mothers, we can reframe the oppression of women as caused by a struggle between kinds of economies. We have recently come out of the struggle between the economies of communism and capitalism, but a more fundamental distinction and a more universal struggle continues to exist between the economies of gift giving and those of the market. There are two main oppressive factors causing this struggle. One is patriarchy and the other is market exchange. Patriarchy is the hierarchical control of giving and of the givers enacted typically by males. Protected by force, commands are given downwards and gift and services are given upwards for the aggrandizement of the few. Exchange is the denial of gifts by requiring an equivalent return. Patriarchal capitalism is the combination of patriarchy and exchange so that gifts are controlled and leveraged through the market mechanisms, renamed as profit, accumulated and reinvested in order to leverage still more gifts. The values of male competition for dominance have been abstracted and generalized and they are used to motivate capitalist accumulation for the hegemonic power of the few. An advantage of considering mothering as the core of an economy is that we can see it in Marxian terms as an economic base and attribute a superstructure to it. That is, we can see that the values of direct giving and receiving, other orientation, mutuality, and trust derive from a practical, life-sustaining, interactive behavior rather than from an innate tendency to nurture or a specific moral sense. One of the great weapons that patriarchal capitalism has for dominating the gift economy is its ability to pro propose its own superstructure, both by creating an ethics based on the market and by imposing its own epistemology. In this way, it eliminates mothering, its competitor, from consciousness not only because mothers are rarely seen in positions of patriarchal power, but also because mothering is not used as an interpretative key for understanding the way we know the world. I continue to be surprised by how wide the gap is between patriarchal capitalist superstructural epistemology and the hidden mother-based gift economy and epistemology. 
Actually, this patriarchal epistemology and its accompanying ethics are part of the reason for wars and exploitation. Because they occupy the field of knowledge, they convince us that there are no alternative perspectives. So we accept the authority of patriarchal and market-based decisions. Looking through the glasses of exchange eliminates the gift and does not allow it to generalize. In contrast, a maternalist view would reveal that the early other-oriented gift mode of distribution is not only the basis of the other possible forms of economy, but also of language and other sign behaviors that are necessary for human knowledge and communication. Communication is a, a, a word that I like to think of as made of co, muni, and cation. Muni means gifts in Latin, so it would mean giving gifts together. And the same with community, so that's, uh, I'm not sure that's a, a totally um, accurate derivation, but that's a, a great way of looking at it, I think. The ethics deriving from the various modes of gifting are not concerned with issues of hierarchy and domination, but they have a different source, which includes the well-being of the other already in the makeup of the human. For example, considering language and communication in general as directed towards satisfying the communicative and cognitive needs of the other, and only thereby satisfying one's own needs for self-expression, involves the other in the self's own makeup in a basic way. Self-expression is not the main purpose of communication, but instead commu connection with others and the establishment of a shared reality and coordinated point of view. Individual linguistic creativity in the manner of Noam Chomsky is unimportant and indeed hardly happens unless it serves to connect us with others. Connecting with others requires giving them word gifts and word gift combinations that are useful for them. I envision an epistemology that is based on the connections between the gift economy, mothering, and matriarchy. I believe that the matriarchal patterns that Heidi Gottner Abendroth, who's a German woman who's initiated um, mat modern matriarchal studies, um, they are that those patterns are based on the patterns patterns of mothering and being mothered, which are very similar cross culturally, because the needs of young children are very similar. However, the patterns may be enacted in various ways and by various players. Child care may be carried out by one mother or many, members of an extended family or of a whole village. Men can do mothering too, though in non-matriarchal societies they usually don't, and I believe the exclusion of child care from the construction of the masculine identity is one of the basic reasons for patriarchy. Perhaps it is because other orientation appears in the patriarchal frame as altruism and morality that there is a great opposition to it when it is attributed to mothers. This creates a screen against what mothers actually do. Unilateral giving is made to seem unrealistic and sentimental, but is, it is actually just a basic transitive interaction in which one person satisfies the needs of another. Mothers unilaterally satisfy the needs of children, and they have to do this because when they are young, children do not understand paying back. If someone did not satisfy their needs unilateral, the children, unilaterally, the children would not survive. This, is, this imposes an, impo an important and time-consuming job on most mothers. Very detailed attention is required to the child's physical and emotional needs and the appropriate ways to satisfy them have to be found. Mothers and other caregivers form a kind of special first ecological niche for their children, a niche which takes the initiative to satisfy its creature's needs. In this, they are like nature, but more proactive. Mothers lay down the pattern of A gives X to B from the child's earliest days, where X is a need-satisfying gift good or service, 
that the mother A gives to the child B. This is the pattern that is at the beginning of the thread of the transitive communicative gift logic that permeates life. It is a logic of human relations that is invested with emotion, creating mutuality and trust already in early childhood for most children most of the time. That is, the interaction of giving and receiving is the way expectations are created and fulfilled and positive re relations are created. Since this gift interaction is necessary for the child's survival, it is not surprising that humans endow it with significance, even when they eliminate it from consciousness. Motherers give and receive many different kinds of things, and most babies learn to imitate and do turn-taking from very early on. Very young children smile when their parents smile at them, respond to their sister's antics by laughing, and try to put a half-eaten cookie in their mother's mouth. Sometimes we use the word exchange for this giving and receiving, but it is a dangerous use because it assimilates the interaction to the exchange that takes place on the market. I prefer to use the terms turn-taking in unilateral giving and receiving. The mother takes the initiative to give to the child who receives. Then the child takes the initiative to give to the mother who receives and vice versa. This turn-taking continues throughout life and it is elaborated at many levels. It functions according to imitation rather than obligation. Recently, cognitive neuropsychologists have done experiments which they say show that altruism is innate. Children 18 months old voluntarily help experimenters who pretend to be in difficulty. Um, so like the, the experimenter drops, is, whose hands are full, drops a um, clothespin and the children come and pick it up and, and give it to the experimenter without uh, being asked to do it. And so they say, the experimenters say this is innate. Um, but mothering is left out of the explanation of the children's al altruism um, by these researchers. In fact, considering al altruism to be innate denies the model of mothering. Altruism must come at least in part from being mothered, from someone recognizing your needs and satisfying them day after day, minute after minute, with many different things and in many different contexts. This model of mothering is available to be imitated by everyone. We play all the different roles in a basic maternal script we give gifts or services of many different kinds, receive them, and pass them on to others. Cognitive psychologists Lakoff and Johnson uh, started a kind of philosophical revolution some 35 years ago when they began to revise the concept of metaphor, recognizing it as a cognitive device coming from common human experiences of the body. They say that the corporeal or spatial logic arriving, arising from bodily experience is what provides the basis for the abstract log, logic of thought. However, they only consider the individual body from the skin inward. Instead, it would be more accurate if they said intercorporeal logic and intercorporeal bodily experience. And, and later I'll show you a short video of, of some people who are doing interpersonal neurobiology. Lakoff and Johnson introduced them and made popular the, image, the idea of image schemas, very elementary but repeatable patterns of bodily experience such as up and down, path to goal, and going into or out of containers and these are mapped into language at various levels. I believe the image schema that underlies both material and verbal communication is the interactive interpersonal sensory motor schema of giving and receiving, first located not in the body of the child alone, but between the mother and child, beginning in a moment in which the child has recently been part of the body of the mother and proceeding through the long period du during which she is dependent, she or he is dependent on the mother's 
need satisfying gifts and services for his or her body's very existence. From this point of view, giving and receiving is the underlying pattern, the image schema of material and verbal communication, expressed and embodied in a routine that the child learns with her mother's milk, a minimal play or script with three roles, giver, gift or service, and receiver. This routine, which is repeated in many different ways, is the interpersonal, intercorporeal experience that provides the basis for the logic of abstract thought. The child can play all of the roles of this routine. She is a giver, or he is a giver, because he or she gives smiles, cries, and gestures, as well as urine and feces, which are creatively received by the parent. She is, or he, is carried and birthed, given to life by the mother, and, and given her or himself by adults, like a gift from hand to hand. She or he creatively, not passively, receives her or his mother's care of all kinds and also the perceptions and experiences that come from his or her surroundings. Sometimes this creative reception means that she or he proactively, not passively, goes out to explore the world around her or him, crawling to reach the table, grabbing the keys, and chewing on the book. That is, the creativity of the reception includes the fact that the child actively goes forward to receive the perceptual gifts. Two other early mother-child interactions are mind reading, which is necessary for satisfying needs, and joint attention. Mind reading is not a psychic ability, but a down-to-earth capacity to guess what the baby needs by putting ourselves in her place and by thinking of the context. The baby is crying and she has not eaten for several hours, so she or he is probably hungry. So we satisfy the need for food instead of the need for a bath. Young children around the age of 15 months have been tested by psychologists for mind reading ability, and it has been found that they are able to mind read some of the contextual information adults have and understand their intentions and desires by following posture and eye gaze. Pointing for jo joint attention is also giving a perceptual gift by drawing the other's attention to it, and I would say that in joint attention, both mother and child are receivers together of the same perceptual gifts. Um, these abilities and their elaborations continue to permeate adult life in many ways, but we do not recognize them even though we are doing them, and we do not remember what we, that we learned to do them in infancy. For example, we watch a movie together, and this is joint attention. Or we go to a conference and listen to the speaker together, and this is joint attention. Even writing or reading a book allows author and reader to establish joint attention with each other uh, regarding the topics, even if they never meet. These are maternal patterns, patterns that are an integral part of mothering and being mothered, which can be said also to be matriarchal patterns in their adult elaboration of care for the other and the direct satisfaction of needs through gifting. The underst understanding of others' needs by mind reading, by putting oneself in the other's place, and by attentive listening is necessary for gift giving, but also for the kinds of communication upon which community is founded. Joint attention is also a community building capacity when it is done in a group, which focuses its attention on the same thing, creating common knowledge. Moreover, it is a prerequisite for joint decision-making and consensus. As adults, we continue to mind read what others are attending to or not. We give them what they need to cause them to turn their attention to something. This is what we do with language. We speak in the language others understand. Use the words they know. We mind read what the other's communicative needs are and give them words to satisfy them. These are gifts of words, virtual verbal gifts, which create joint attention and mutual relations among givers and receivers. In the same way that giving and receiving material gifts creates joint attention and mutual relations. Language like mothering is other oriented. 
since all our words come to us as gifts passed on to us from others in the linguistic community, they carry with them a relation to the group as well as to the individual giver, speaker, or writer. This other-oriented maternal relation among individuals and with the group is reaffirmed whenever we speak or write. Even when I say ego-oriented things, I have to satisfy the other's communicative needs. If I say, that is my piece of cake and you can't have any, I still have to use the words you understand, and this puts us in a social relation to my refusal to give. Patriarchy and capitalism eliminate mother-based gift giving from the explanation of the world in much the same way that they eliminate adult gifting from the understanding of economics. Yet, to have a clear picture of our problems, it is necessary to restore gifting to view. Um, and I would say now, in this sense that we're in this context of science for peace, I think most of science has excluded the maternal perspective and the mother-child interaction, the giving and receiving, from the way it uh, approaches the world. And uh, I want to show you a, a video of this interpersonal neurobiologist who talks about um, the attachment between mothers and children. And in this way, uh, the way he talks shows a lot about um, how this interaction happens and how our, our um, social interaction influences our genetic makeup. I think this is an amazing piece of, of uh, information that, it's, that I have not had until now, and now I'm putting it into everything I, I write. Um, even this interpersonal neurobiologist doesn't have any idea of the gift economy, doesn't have any idea of emphasizing giving and receiving. But it's very interesting to hear what he says. So can we turn it on? Just three minutes. One of the great fallacies uh, that many scientists have is that everything that is before birth is genetic and that everything that is after birth is learned. This is not the case. There is more genetic material in the cerebral cortex at 10 months, much, much more than there is at birth. What this means is that the genes are spinning out, are programming well into the first year. They don't stop at birth. And the genes that are encoding the connections between those parts of the brain that are coming on later, therefore, are in a very active state well into the first year. That is, the lower parts of the brain and the brain stem, etc., are well uh, advanced at birth, but many parts of the cerebral cortex are not even myelinated at birth. Not even, essentially, at birth, you've got a subcortical infant there. And parts of the human brain are not coming online until well into the first year. So as a matter of fact, at 10 months or 12 months, which is the first time when the attachment patterns are measured by the strange situation, I've suggested that the prefrontal areas now for the first time are coming online. The, the growth spurt of the brain is occurring from the last trimester of infancy through the second year. And at that time, the, the brain is more than doubling in size. It's connecting up. But it's maturation is experience dependent. It's not as if the genes are encoding how everything is going to fall together. It needs certain types of experiences for the brain to grow. And the most important parts of the brain that we're looking at in the first year to grow by my own thoughts are those parts of the brain that are involved with the emotional and the social functioning of the child. Those are the ones which are embedded in the attachment relationship. In order for those parts of the brain to grow, which is part of the limbic system involved with emotion, certain experiences are needed. Those experiences are embedded in the relationship between the caregiver and, and the infant. If they're positive, if they're regulated, then we'll have an optimal situation. And literally, the potentiality of the genes will be carried forth to the fullest, so to speak. 
And so now one of the most important recent discoveries in the last 10 years in biology has been this idea about developmental cell death. The brain does not continue to grow and grow and grow. It organizes, then it disorganizes, then it reorganizes. And the disorganization of the brain, which is the mass of death of billions of neurons and the disconnections of synapses, is part of how the brain is growing as it's reorganizing. Those uh, connections that are not used die off, which is why early enriched environments, which means emotionally in early enriched environments, more so than wonderful little uh, dangling colors and shapes, uh, are key here. As if to say there is something in, there's something necessary that the, human need, that the human brain needs in terms of other human contact for it to grow. It's a use it or lose it situation. Cells that fire together, wire together. Cells that do not die together. So, yeah. So, um, the other thing I wanted to add to that that he says elsewhere and others say elsewhere is that um, the, in the er early years, the child adds 40,000 new neuron connections every second. So that also is a real paradigm shifter because you can see this huge ability to learn in the, in the beginning and how assimilating those first patterns of giving and receiving is, are uh, absolutely fundamental. And the, when they don't experience giving and receiving in some area, those cells die off. And so uh, the, the social interaction sculpts our brain um, from the beginning. And they do talk about some sculpting later on as well, but this is the most important period, is this early childhood. And so we are programmed, basically, to do giving and receiving. And we continue to do that throughout life. But we have created a, another uh, logic, another mode at, from this uh, gift mode. And in fact, it becomes elaborated in many different ways. But the main one that we've created is exchange. That is, exchange is a double gift. You give only uh, in order to receive, and so the gift has to come back to you. And so that stops the other orientation and the ability to keep make it going on and on and on to, uh, to still others and others. Um, and, and we have a whole economy that's based on exchange. And uh, we also have um, quite a few, um, um, let's say, metaphors of exchange <laughs> as well as some of giving. We have those. Uh, in our society. We don't recognize them as that. For example, individual of violence and reprisal, military attacks and counterattacks function according to the logic of exchange. Justice as payment for crime is an exchange contrasted with restorative justice. Vengeance is, of course, an exchange. Experiencing guilt is putting oneself in the exchange mode preparing oneself to pay. The marriage market and the idea of human capital translate gift potentialities into exchange paradigm language. The commodification and trafficking of women, children, and body parts, and the porn trade all demonstrate the parasitism of exchange on gifting. In fact, the whole system of global capitalism de developed parasitically by plundering the free native lands of the indigenous people of the Americas and ex by extracting the forced gifts of indigenous and African slave labor uh, in the U.S. So um, exchange is absolutely, the market is a very pernicious uh, development of the gift. And it has been, as I said, infused uh, with patriarchal values of domination. Um, and I, I think that 
maybe I said it already, that um, little boys are pushed into patriarchy by making them in, have a gender category that is different from their nurturing mothers when they're in the situation of being nurtured as the basis of their lives and participating in the gift economy when they're little and then not able to do that anymore as they grow up and not wanting to be a mama's boy or um, a, a girl, they're pushed into a mode of um, domination. And I think that actually hitting is uh, a, a, one of those um, like developments of the gift in the sense that you reach out and touch somebody, but not to nurture them, but to dominate them. And so it's an offshoot of gifting that has been used by patriarchy. And the whole market allows people to interact without doing gift giving, or at least seemingly without doing gift giving, because profit is actually a gift from the worker to the capitalist in the sense of surplus value, which is not being paid for by the capitalist. Um, so it's, it's free, although it's forced. And the same with the gifts of nature. And the same with women's labor in the home. So we have a lot of free gifting going on that's ignored and that it's it funneled under another definition into profit. So um, I want to talk a little bit more still about um, matriarchy and matriarchal patterns that are patterns coming from this transitive interaction of mothering and being mothered. These interactions create the mutuality and trust that cause physical and psychological well-being and encourage the families to stay together. Dominance creates a different kind of relationship based on force. Um, the pattern of unilateral giving and receiving continues on many different levels throughout life. Gifts given unilaterally can propagate throughout the community, linking givers and receivers who are all then related to each other. The links break when exchange and the market step in. Ego orientation takes the place of other orientation. Exchange requires an equation and me measurement of quantity because it creates an adversarial situation where each is trying to get more than the other. Where gift giving is trans transitive, exchange is intransitive, every man for himself. At the same time, many free gifts are given to the market. In fact, the market is floating on a sea of gifts. The capitalist mode of production is built on top of the gift economy and fu functions by surreptitiously taking the free gifts of all and making them into profit. Um, the gifts of the many are channeled to the few, actually creating the scarcity that is necessary for the market to function. Abundance, which makes gift giving easy, is not functional to the market economy. Scarcity is better for the corporations. It keeps the prices high. When too much abundance accrues, nations deplete and destroy it by making wars, transfer, transferring large amounts of wealth to the arms manufacturers. They prepare future bonanzas by plundering the resources of those they conquer and destroying infrastructure in the target countries, which will eventually be rebuilt by the conqueror nations and corporations. We need to return to the relational logic of the maternal gift economy and leave aside the logic of exchange with its cognates of punishment and vengeance. We need to make a social and mental space for the elaboration of the maternal and matriarchal patterns of gift giving and receiving and for the theory and practice of the gift economy led by women, by mothers and daughters who maintain and honor the values of mothering and being mothered. Men who have not lost the nurturing values they learned as children should support this initiative. The examples of matriarchies, and even just the idea of matriarchy, allow this. Not only has mothering been exploited, but the ideas and patterns coming from mothering have been misrecognized 
exploited and used against mothers, children, and everyone. Unilateral giving has been taken over by patriarchal institutions like the religions. It has been framed as unrealistic or saintly. It has been reframed as altruism, charity, and volunteerism, which appear to be partly partial in individualistic solutions but hardly important enough to be the organizing principle of society itself. In the present time of crisis, in a more subtle way, even the gift economy movement itself discredits mothering because although it practices both unilateral and multilateral gift giving, it has no idea gifting has anything to do with mothering. If we do not create or find a mother-based epistemology and rationale for change, we will simply accept the domination of the field of giving one more time by men and women who ignore mothering with the result that the gift economy movement will lose most of its healing and revolutionary potential. Women will be left to follow their assimilationist path to equality with patriarchal capitalist men. And as they, we, are assimilated and reap the material rewards, they, or we, will be equally responsible for the evil that is perpetrated by the patriarchal capitalist gift plundering system. The superstructure of the gift economy validates other orientation, not only towards our individual families, but also towards all the social groups that are exploited by patriarchal capitalism. When we are not other oriented in this way, we are in contradiction with our maternal heritage. The wars that our governments are now perpetrating contradict gifting, and the most widespread war is the one we are waging against Mother Earth. We need to turn our other-oriented consciousnesses and care towards all the victims of these wars, including her. <laughs>